Hello. All right. I think we're live. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another episode of CS Presents. It's a series of weekly inspiration and education webinars from creative professionals around the world. A um, few items of business right off the top. If you could please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. That just makes it a little bit easier for us to filter out any questions that you may have. You can also ask them off, obviously, on the various social platforms where this is being shared. And the Creative Solutions team that's working behind the scenes can help me filter through those. Um, if you're not familiar with Creative Solutions, uh, Creative Solutions is made up of Teradex, Small HD, and Wooden Camera. If you're a filmmaker, you're probably familiar with at least one, if not all of those brands. Don't forget to follow all of them on their social channels. Uh, okay, let's dive in. My name is Graham Ehler Sheldon. I am a filmmaker. I'm mostly producer DP credits. I was fortunate enough to finish up my fifth feature film right before the pandemic started. I also work on the TV and commercial side for clients like Lucasfilm, Ubisoft, uh, ITV, BBC, Vice, NBC, Pepsi. Um, and the list goes, goes on a little bit after that. But the uh, discussion today is called The Cinematic Difference Elevating Live Streams. What skills can be taken from field production that will work and elevate streaming? This is a question that I think we're all starting to deal with more and more these days. But I want to make sure I intro Dan Greats here. Hello, Dan. Graham, how you going? Thanks for having me. No, thank you. So, um, Dan Greats is a filmmaker based in Brisbane, Australia. For more than 15 years, he's worked extensively throughout his home country, as well as New Zealand, Southeast Asia, and the US, creating content for live events, broadcast, and digital distribution. Um, and Dan, I think just right off the bat, you're a, do you think of yourself as sort of a DIY uh, filmmaker? Is that a fair? Characterization. Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair, pardon me, pretty fair representation. I'm, I'm self-taught. I was studying law and business when I started making videos to pay for my uni fees and just figured it out from there and, and things grew and quit uni and here we are, <clears throat> pardon me, 15 years later. Um, so yeah, I think I've come from a pretty wide variety of backgrounds. I probably started off in, in a filmmaking sense, mostly in the event AV kind of area and then transitioned to, into editing animation, eventually cinematography. And now with the world that we're living in with COVID and lockdowns and quarantines, the, the live event part of it's kind of come back and been useful again to combine all of these nerdy toys in a way that you can use in a live environment. Yeah, well, we're going to get into the nerdy toys that are sort of surrounding you there uh, in a moment. But I think a great example of sort of your DIY approach to filmmaking is actually the, uh, a specific music video for Violent Soho called uh, Ceremona Said. And if you don't mind, Dan, I would really love if we just kind of kick things off by you playing that first asset package. There it is. Yeah, can you just kind of walk us through how you pulled off what is essentially a, a Children of Men rig, for those familiar with that film, um, on, a, on a budget, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is, pardon me, I'm just going to clear. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, it is unashamedly a uh, ripoff of the famous one shot in Children of Men where they're in the car and they're going down the, the, the sort of jungle. There it is, the shot of it going down the street being chased by, by zombies. So we wanted to figure out how to do that on a DIY budget, very, very small budget. Basically went and bought a secondhand station wagon off the classifieds. Uh, I had a friend of mine who's really handy with an angle grinder, chop a big slit down the roof and built our own, welded up our own roof racks and... Uh, mounted my motion control system. I've got a couple of those, a cam block motion control system, mounted that to the roof so that we'd have the ability to move the camera anywhere inside the car, pan, tilt, dolly, focus. Um, there's a few shots of the, the cam block system in action. Um, and basically I'd have the ability to do all that while lying in the boot of the station wagon covered in dirty old clothes and skateboards. Uh, so we basically drove around an industrial estate and had this story of four kids who were trying to get to the band's concert. Uh, they sort of go around and pick each other up progressively. And then at the end, we actually worked out a way to quick release the camera off the motion control so that we didn't have to cut. We could, we could rip the camera out of the car, chase them into the event at the very end of the clip. And it was all done in one single take. There's the quick release system there. So yeah, all done in one single take um, with a fairly high degree of nerdery. And you can see how DIY it was. It was just a tarp. 
uh, duct tape to the roof of the car to keep the rain out. And uh, yeah, it's it's a pretty good example of of not just me, a pretty amazing team coming together to pull something like that off. I mean, I think we had something like three hundred extras or something around those those lines, and they were all sprinting on every take and chasing us around as the car drove. So yeah, it was a pretty fun pretty fun outing. Uh, still don't quite know how we pulled it off, but we got there in the end. I mean, to be honest, a, a shoot like this is the kind of thing that gives me just absolute heart palpitations sort of looking at, I mean, it makes <laughs> it makes my palms sweaty watching something like this because to execute it, something like this, very, very, very tough. The other thing that makes my palms sweaty a little bit is to be honest, streaming. Um, because my background uh, prior to say two to three months ago is just 100% field production um, as I'm sure is the case with maybe some, if not all of the people uh, watching, I just had no streaming background. And like many out there, I sort of had to, had to pivot and become at least more interested and more capable when it comes to streaming. So uh, ideally, if you're somebody watching this stream, I think the perfect viewer is somebody who has a, a ton of field production experience, already has that specific kit, and then is trying to find ways to translate that into the world of, uh, of streaming. So Dan, maybe now's a good time to sort of walk in, um, walk us through some of the equipment that's sort of surrounding you right now and your specific streaming setup, which uh, in short is super cool, so. Yeah, for sure. So I guess the the event that kind of brought us all here was a listening party that we did for Violent Soho, uh, where they were about to launch a new album. It was a huge deal. Then COVID hit, they realized they wouldn't be able to do their normal kind of uh, album tours and books, uh, sorry, album signings and touring and things like that. So they had to do it all virtually. So we brought two of the band members around to my home studio. We, because of social restriction, sorry, uh, social distancing restrictions at the time, the other two, as you can see there, had to come in over Zoom. I had to do all this over an ADSL one 3.5 megabit per second connection. So I had to figure out a bunch of really nerdy ways to get around that insane limitation because of Australia's ridiculous internet uh, and the video go from Teradek, which we can talk about later was the absolute lifesaver that pulled that off um, but if, as you can kind of see from these samples here I, I attacked this initially from that melding those two worlds together the film production world and the event world by taking the cameras I had which was a monster a red monstro a Canon C500 Mark II and in that case it was a 6D Mark II that was on a little slider trying to bring all those into a video switching environment and then sending that output to the Teradek to then send out to uh, Facebook and YouTube. And one interesting little aside on that, during the live stream, YouTube actually yanked the stream from their channel because they thought that Violent Soho were ripping off their own copyright, which is a nice little uh, internet to duck in there. Uh, fortunately, because of the video go, we were sending out to Facebook at the same time, which meant that fans still had an option to go to while they re, uh, reauthorized the stream on YouTube. So that's that's another really strong selling point of, of that way of doing things. Um, but if I pull that one away, I can talk you through the rest of the setup here. Well, well, um, before so, you go and, sorry to interrupt you, Dan. Before you jump into that, no, though, go were, for it. were you totally, Violent Soho approached you with this idea? You pitched this idea to the band? I mean, what were your initial concerns about executing something like this? Yeah, I mean, well, mainly the internet, as you can tell from how I talk about it. Uh, it's, it's something that still keeps me awake at night. Um, the, the We'd been talking about something actually a lot more elaborate where they were going to do like an eight-hour telethon where they'd have fans through like a Zoom webinar Buy, if they bought the album, that gave them a ticket to the webinar and then they'd be able to come on and actually interact with the band and get a virtual signing of the album. Um, for various reasons, we weren't able to pull that off. So we sort of scaled it back to, okay, let's let's listen to the whole album. The band can talk about it. So we, we sort of had special things set up where we could duck the music underneath their voices as they spoke. I pre-produced those graphics you saw across the bottom where it had the waveform bouncing to the music just as a way of kind of giving people something extra to look at and making it about the music instead of just about talking heads. Um, so yeah, it was it was an evolution of just basically sheer necessity. They, I think we we changed the plan on who was going to be here and who was not the day before we started. We didn't know who was going to be in which position, so it was definitely just you know rolling with the punches and making it making it work. Very cool. Um, okay, so before you hop into kind of explaining the setup that you have around you, Dan, I just just note for anyone watching, feel free to hit us at any point with any questions related to streaming. Now is the time over the next sort of 45 or uh, 50 minutes here. Keep those questions coming. Okay, so Dan, what is uh, what is around you? I mean, I can recognize some of these things, but 
What's surrounding you? Yeah, the, so the the camera angles I'm working with here, so the one you're looking at at the moment is a Canon C500 Mark II, and that's got an Atlas Orion anamorphic lens on it. So it's actually running in anamorphic mode. Um, you, I was hoping to get 4K out of that to show you a couple of cool things with the software I'm using. Unfortunately, a limitation of the C500 is in anamorphic mode, the 4K output, it's just completely squashed. If anyone knows about anamorphic, basically you, you're shooting something that's optically squashed in together and then then your various devices are responsible for uns, unsqueezing that. Um, unfortunately, that's not possible here. So you're looking at a 1080p feed from that C500. Uh, next to me is the trusty Red Monstro 8K. Uh, that's also got an Atlas lens on it. I can show you the camera angle there. So not a particularly useful angle because I'm also using the Monstro basically as a nerd prop in the in the scene. That's why it's so close to me, uh, but still had an opportunity to put a gratuitous lens flare as you always do when you're shooting with anamorphic lenses, of course. Um, coming back to me, I've also got the ability with the system that I'm running to make other camera angles out of the C500. So I can jump in and I can chat to you here and put something up beside me on that side, or I could do it on the other side, put something up here. Um, as you can see with the 1080p feed, you know, it's starting to fall apart a little bit. I was That's why I was hoping to get the 4K output, um, but I felt like being a wanker and having an anamorphic lens was a higher priority than 4K quality. Um, but you can see there just that tiny little bit of depth of field on those lenses. So there's the background in focus and there's me in focus. It's subtle, but it's just enough to give that little bit of separation to make it feel a bit more cinematic and a little easier on the eyes because of the ridiculous amount of geeky stuff that I've chosen to put behind me. Um, a couple of other camera angles. So I've got a Canon 6D over here. That's on a little slider, which I'll, I'll be able to take a camera around and show you some close-ups on these things in a second. I've also got uh, my phone here. Just one second, that should pop up any minute. There it is. So I've got my phone running in wirelessly. So I can basically, there's, hey Graham, how you doing? Good to hey. see you. Uh, so I can use that to head around and show you a few different things. And then I've also got the webcam on the iMac behind me is like a little kind of behind the scenes -y wide angle. And I guess there is a bit of method to that madness. It's because I don't want to freak people out. I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm a nerd. I've got no life. That's why I've got all these toys. Not everybody's got this many toys. So I don't want to freak people out. You've got sort of a, a, a downward progression in attainability here. So going from the monstro all the way down to a webcam. So It'll be good to kind of step you through all of that. But if you want, I can kind of just run you through a few little, I guess, theoretical ideas that set yeah. the foundation for how I think the, the, the cinematic approach works. Yeah, maybe, yeah, for pe people like me, Dan. So right now, let me show you my camera angle. That is my angle. So could you help me with, understand how beautiful. I can improve? It's beautiful, Graham. Th thank you so much. <laughs> can you help me improve um, my streaming capabilities? Uh, you know, I, I have cameras, I have things like that. But yeah, just for us... Um, uh, usual folk, what is a good way to approach um, improving the quality of our streams? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll bring up some graphics both for didactic purposes and to show you what's possible in a live stream environment. So if I bring up these, these are just some ideas about what I'm trying to achieve or what I'm recommending people try to achieve in their live streams. So firstly, wait up, where am I? There I am. I only just made these graphics at 4am this morning. So sorry about that. Uh, what I'm saying is you don't, re you, we're trying to avoid using webcams or phones as our primary method of streaming. Obviously that's the easiest way to get into streaming and I wouldn't want to stop anyone from doing that, but I'm just saying that you want to get away from that if you're trying to up the production values of your stream. Next is shallow depth of field. So the idea with that is you want to use the biggest sensor that you can get your hands on in terms of a camera and you want to use fast lenses. You want to use them wide open where possible so that you create that separation between your talking head or whatever your subject matter is and the background. It's an instant way of making things feel more high end. It's also a great way of drawing the viewer's attention where you want it to go. Um, the next one's coverage. By that, I mean multiple camera angles. So if you're doing a live stream about your new favorite recipe for chicken wings, if you've got the ability to cut from your talking head to a shot of the grill, suddenly the audience are going to be, oh, oh, okay, this is interesting. I'm, I'm going to stick around. I'm, I'm engaged. Because I guess in a live scene, people get a bit scared of multiple camera angles because it's hard enough to get one camera onto the net, let alone multiples, but it's way easier than you think. And we're going to talk through all of that. Uh, I've got controlled lighting up there. So when I take you around the studio, you'll see my setup. I've got all my lights mounted on a roof system. Um, movement, I think, is really important just because it really adds that cinematic element. If you can have a camera on a slider, there's so many options these days for automated 
camera movement where you can just set something to, to bounce backwards and forwards slowly. It's autonomous. You just leave it go and it's an angle you can cut to. So if I cut to that Canon 6D right now, you can see that's just slowly moving around me and it just adds that little extra production value to what you're doing. Um, quality audio is really important. So I'm talking to you at the moment on an overhead mic, which I'll show you shortly. I've also, when I walk around, you'll see my really bad gaff tape job here. Uh, if I switch, you can hear. So that's the lapel mic there. Can you hear that coming through okay? Can you sort of um, hear the difference there? I can, yeah, yeah. You can? Yeah, so that, for me, an overhead mic, a really good quality overhead mic is a much better way of getting that presence where you feel like you're really talking to the person. So Back to that. You do hear a little bit more of the room, so it's very dependent on what kind of room you're in, but um, that's another thing we can talk about. And finally, down the bottom there, I've got graphics. That's uh, for me, I'm a person with a very short attention span. So I don't want to just look at a person's talking head. I want to see something that creates another level of storytelling. And I think graphics done tastefully are a really great way of doing that. The graphics that I've got here that I just knocked up this morning, just to show how easy it is. These are just done in Apple Keynote. So the equivalent of PowerPoint. So I just did these in Keynote, exported them with a transparent background. And then I was able to lay that into my software to, to play on top of a live camera shot. So you can see that there's really no excuse not to have nice animated graphics on your shot. It's something that I think is really beneficial. Um, so if I get rid of that quickly and just take you to a few ideas of the workflows that you can use for streaming. So obviously the simplest way is just to have a single camera going up to the net. Something like the video go, which I used for that telethon is extremely yeah. powerful because sorry, it's battery sorry powered. Dan. Sorry. Um, I, if you don't mind, I'm uh, just getting a few questions coming in here and, and I think you're about to hit some of these. So um, yeah, go a, few, for it. a few people yep. pointed out that the lapel mic didn't sound like it was the lav. It sounded like it was maybe on the table or something. That's probably true. I don't know. Um, ah, no, you okay, right. Uh, hmm. um, so okay. right now you should be hearing me through the overhead mic. There could be some technical difficulties there, but no, um, no it's all right. I mean, so if I uh, switch, if I switch across to the lapel mic, it could just be because of my very poor miking skills that I've where I've placed it isn't perhaps giving you the best quality. Okay, um, but you can hear, you can hear my voice at the moment. I can hear you. It does sound like um, it does sound like room um, of some kind being recorded versus kind of localized, but that's all right. So. Oh, I, you know what? I'll just switch over while I fix that. So just just talk amongst yourselves. So uh, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. You want to no, hit me up with another question? Yeah. So so here's one. So I, I've been hearing about um, OBS a lot. I think primarily because it's free. Um, now I'm not asking you to, to kind of dive into what this software is necessarily, but I have a question from Sanford Lewis. Which software platform are you using to produce the stream feed on on your side? So I think you're headed there. Yeah. Yeah, I am headed there. Yeah, so that's down the bottom of our um, little set of graphics there. Uh, sorry, I've almost got this lapel fixed up for you. Sorry about that, guys. No worries. I think I just got excited and it uh, yanked itself out of the the extremely MacGyvered gaff tape solution that I'm using. Okay. All right. Let's see how that goes. So if I switch now, does that sound any better? Yes. You got a little bit more clarity there? Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Very unprofessional of me. No, no, no. No, uh, no, it's fine. Back to the overhead. <laughs> so yeah, just going through those three methods. So the, the the camera direct to some kind of a streaming device is obviously the easiest. And the video go, you could you could actually mount it on top of a camera, be out in the field doing some kind of reporting or a live cross or something. And that can be sending out to multiple sources at the same time. Then the next one down, this one here, there it is. There it is. Uh, that one is sort of representative of that listening party that we talked about originally. That's where I took all these cameras that I had for general filmmaking purposes, worked out a way to feed them into a video switcher, brought in another computer that played the graphics into that switcher, and then the output of that switcher went to the video go to get out to the net. What I'm doing here today is more the, the bottom option, which is multiple cameras into a piece of software. That software gives, the, gives me the ability to do a lot of layering. And then uh, that I'm, I'm running the output of that out through SDI into Zoom so that you guys can see that. I could also run the output of that into something like the video go if I wanted to stream directly if it wasn't in this kind of webinar situation. And it's so the video as far go, as the software goes. Paco Herrera, it's the video go is what he's referencing. And maybe um, if someone from the Creative Solutions team, that um, Teradek has a great breakdown of sort of their five to six different devices that sort of uh, do what Dan's talking about right now. Maybe you can pop that link uh, over into the comments just while Dan's talking. I think that'll knock out a couple questions off there. All right, sorry to interrupt, Dan, after you. 
No, that's fine. Yeah. So to, to answer the question that was asked earlier about software. So if you're on a Windows machine, your options are OBS, um, which is a great open source package. vMix is a really, really popular one. Little shout out there because I haven't used it myself. I've heard it's extremely powerful, but it's actually uh, developed by a guy here on the Gold Coast, which is um, in the same state as Queensland as me. So that's just a little local represent. Uh, and then the software I'm using because I'm a Mac guy is Mimo Live, which I think is from a German company. And I'm, I'm only just getting into it, but the possibilities are just endless. And I'll show you a few of the cool things that that can do later. Um, but the important thing, so software like all of those three options have the ability to stream out within their own infrastructure. But the just to quickly touch on that video go, if you're getting some questions about that, I'll just switch back to the main angle here and actually I'll pull up the iPhone. So this is the video go here. Um, the, the brilliant part of it is that you've got multiple networks that can bond together. So there's an ethernet connection here. This is These are two Wi-Fi antennas. And then each of these are what they call nodes. So they each contain a 4G SIM card, which connects to a cellular network. And what happens is all of these connections bond together to create like a Captain Planet unbreakable bond out to the internet that gives you the peace of mind to know that if one of them drops out, something else is going to take up the slack. And not only that, they aggregate their speed together so that if you've only got sort of lower speeds on each one, by the time their powers combine, you've got a much more stable option. Yeah. So you're giving yourself just a little bit of redundancy there in the one place that you're really not able to control, which is your ISP, your internet service provider. So that's one of the cool things about that device. Exactly. So when, when I did that listening party, I actually ran a 50 meter SDI cable through my through the roof of my home studio into my main house, up to the second floor, up to the corner of the house where I knew I could get one bar of 4G. And I, I positioned the video go there. And that's where we ran our stream out from. And I don't think my sphincter unclenched uh, until a couple of hours after we finished the live stream. It was, it was that kind of a tense situation, but we got there in the end and literally couldn't have done it without that device. Um, one, if I can just show you one other quick thing in terms, this is both about video and about what you can do in this kind of software environment. So if I just jump across here to a little, so the way that I'm getting the phone into this switching device is uh, a, a protocol known as NDI. That's a really important one for people to learn. So you probably know HDMI, you know SDI, NDI is the next one you need to add. So November Delta India, I think that's the radio code for it. Um, what it does is basically any device on the network that has video capabilities can uh, announce itself to other devices to say, hey, I want to send you some video and those other devices can grab it and display it full screen. And you can do that without running any other cables other than what you've used for your network. It can work wirelessly as you can see with the phone. So if I just bring up this little guy here, so that now you're looking at my phone. So I can jump across to the video app. Uh, let's have a look. So there you can see that's the device just on the desk here. So I can bring that up. I can get into the settings of the device. And if you give me one second, so if I jump into the network, you can see there, those are all the options you've got in the video go. So you've got um, your nodes that are on the sides, you've got a wired network, you've got uh, Wi-Fi can be connected. You can also hotspot up to four phones. So if you've got a bunch of mates with you and you're out doing a stream, everyone can hotspot their phone to the video go. And all of those connections get bonded together as well and just added to this sort of you know, tethered, um, bonded, amazing, unbreakable connection. So it's a really powerful uh, device. I'll just get rid of that one there. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if there's anything, unless you want to, if there's any questions coming in, no, otherwise no, no. I could yeah, take so you around you, and show you some of the... You kind of tackled um, the question from anonymous attendee in stealth mode with the questions, um, who would love to know more info hey, on anonymous. the cell phone feed. Uh, yeah, hey, anonymous uh, feed <laughs> set up. So you kind of tackled that uh we do have a question from brian russell about the atem mini pro where that's in stock none of us unfortunately work for black magic brian i'm so sorry we cannot help with that one <laughs> however are you using the atem mini pro i noticed it was in your graphic dan are you using a switcher of some kind here yeah Maybe i am so do you want me to do you want me to do a little uh blair witch project shaky camera walk around and i'll show you all of the close-ups on what we're working with here please do that is a classic film i would like to see that Okay, cool. So it is just a handheld phone. So it is going to be a little wobbly, but I'll try to activate Steadicam mode in my hand and uh, do the best <laughs> I can there. So if I switch to the phone there, that should come up. Oh, before I do that, I just want to add one other little interesting part. So if I clear that, 
the the bit the, the reason why going into a computer gives you so much power is because of the ability to layer transparent graphics so when i'm punching in on my main camera like that you can see the letterbox is still intact that's because i've got a layer at the top of my um i guess cue list which is just a transparent png graphic keeping that letterbox in place so if i pull that off there you can see so if i went back to the the main camera and then i jump in i lose my letterbox so the ability to have this kind of non-linear, transparent graphic environment mean that, means that I can put that back on there. You can see there I've got my little social media stuff down the bottom. That's another PNG layer that's at the top. Um, you can do the same with animated graphics. So the animations I played before were just a ProRes 444 file with, with a transparent background. So when I did that listing party, I was having to render all of my graphics on top of chroma key green and then this, using the switches capabilities to remove the green and put it over the top of the live camera shot. That's a really convoluted way to go about it. Whereas with this, you can just create things with transparency and load them in as layers and really start to up the production values of what you're doing. So I'll jump across to the phone now. Let's jump in there. And for starters, why don't we start here? So this is just an iPad Pro and this is the power of this software. I'm able to basically create um, a completely flexible cue list, any kind of button I want. I can move them around. So if I go into editing mode, you can see here, I can shift these cues around to any position I want. Sorry. So I can move them into any position that makes sense to me in terms of the flow of the show. And then when I go live, I've got the ability to control. So just coming in close here, you can see there's my two microphones. So that's the overhead mic there. This is the lapel. We're going to walk around now. So I'll turn that one on. And, and Dan, what's the name of the, the app, the queuing app that you're using right now? Question from Dan uh, Winkler. So it's not an app. This is actually just running in a web browser. Memo Live gives people, it, it all. It, this is all part of Memo Live's capabilities. So it, it, it launches a protocol that basically gives you a web address and any device that you use to go to that web address brings up this web interface that lets you create your queuing package. And obviously, I mean, I'm a, a, a bit of a hermit. I, you know, I love to work with a good team, as you saw on that first music video, but I am a bit of a hermit. So the idea of being able to do everything myself and have this much power is pretty amazing to have that kind of thing at your fingertips and still be able to be interacting with the camera and just doing things as you talk. Um, so I've got things like volume level on the different packages that we played. Um, so yeah, let's have a little wander around. So if I come over here, this is the Monstro. Um, you can see there, it's got the, the nice red ultra bright monitor on there. Uh, the wooden camera Zipbox Pro on the front there. You can see the Atlas Orion. This is rigged up in my kind of ideal music video um, rig. So this is the way that I really throw the camera around for kind of more rock videos, things that have a bit of energy to them. There's the new little two terabyte mags that are really handy for longer takes. Um, you can see here, this is one of my favorite parts of it. This is the Teradek Bolt 500 that's built into the camera effectively. So it's a module with no cables. So it just means that my Monstro brain effectively just has wireless built into it, which is terrific. I've got an RT motion system built in. So uh, that's this one here. Um, gives me a whole heap of uh, extra power outputs. Uh, I can run three different lens motors off there. So I've got a finger wheel here and you can see there, that gives me the ability to, with the flick of a finger, pull some pretty dramatic focus on something that would otherwise you'd be sort of cranking a, a follow focus pretty dramatically. Yeah, and Dan, um, if I, so if that's you some... sorry, but if you don't mind me inter yeah. interrupting for a second, keep doing your thing. But, no, please um, do. We had a question from Jay. Uh, will there be a list of all the equipment you're using available somewhere? Do you think, is that is that something you could pop on your social or maybe your website after this, something like that? W would you mind doing that, Dan? Sorry to put you on the spot here, but- Yeah, I'm look, no, that's fine. No, look, I, I was planning to maybe even do a secondary run through of everything in more detail and at another time, if people are interested in that, so we can go through everything in more detail. So we're not kind of wasting people, too much of people's time here. Um, but yeah, happy to go into all the layers of that. I've spent a lot of time putting rigs like that together over the years. So it's kind of a bit of an amalgam of a lot of trial and error. I should mention as well, it's, it's sitting on some parts of my motion control system that I used in that clip that we played the sample of earlier. So these are just little blocks that you can configure in any way you want. And then let me just jump back to the phone there. And then you've got a controller here that you can plot keyframes to create your different motion control moves, or you can use the joystick to control things in real time. So that's how I'm sort of spinning that guy around. Whoops, let's just cancel that. Sorry about that. No, no, um, no worries. Uh, very cool. Um, okay, yeah, if you want to keep going with the tour, yeah, I might pop so in with a few questions. Keep Please do. So if we come around here, this is the main camera. So you've got the C500 Mark II. You've got a teleprompter here with an iPad Pro. 
and that's running on sidecar mode from the MacBook Pro, which has got my Zoom on it. And that's just a way of duplicating the screen to an iPad so that I'm looking directly at your face, but still looking into the lens. And you'll see there, it's got the uh, Atlas Orion 40 mil on it. Um, this is my kind of little preview, so I know what's happening on the show. And I've got that sending wirelessly off a small HD Bolt 500. So that's Dan, coming down to this monitor here. Since you're kind of here right now, Brian Russell has a question. What are you using to connect cameras to the computer? Yeah, that's. Uh, I'll make my way around and that'll become clear very shortly. Um, so just to come around here, so this is the 6D Mark II uh, and that's running on a little one-man crew slider that just sort of bounces back and forwards without me touching it. And Canon released their webcam utility recently, which is a super handy uh, beta application, I suppose. You install it on a computer and all you have to do is connect a USB cable and that comes up as a source that you can use for streaming. So super handy there. So if we come over to the guts of the setup, so that's the Mimo Live software. We've got a nice little video tunnel happening there. Um, and then the way that I'm bringing the cameras in. So again, this is, I guess, talking about using things that you already had to try and achieve the live streaming. If you look here, that's a Blackmagic 4K Mini. Um, that was the device I used to do my color grading in DaVinci Resolve. So that was my output device from um, the computer. It also has an input on it. So Mimo Live can accept that as an input option. So I've got the camera running into that via SDI. I'm also sending back out through that device to Zoom. Um, the Monstro is coming in to this switcher here, which Mimo Live can also control. So I could set up macros to switch to any camera at any time. And then the output of that switcher goes into this, which is from my old, one of my older edit suites. So that's an older output device, output and input device that I was using. A few other things here that I won't go through there basically for bigger shows where I've got more people and I need to get more microphones in and more IFB sends out. I've just got a little RGB parade here and some audio metering that's quite handy. Um, and then so the output of this 4K Mini here is coming over to the A10 Mini Pro. Uh, sorry, this is the A10 Mini, not the A10 Mini Pro. Um, and that's coming in via HDMI. And then it's going USB-C into the MacBook Pro, which tricks Zoom into thinking that this entire ridiculous, overly geeked out setup is just a webcam which is how I'm able to send it to you. And then, as I said before, that sidecarring across to the iPad so I can look into the teleprompter and see uh, you. And if, um, you're, and if you're, yeah. for those of you watching right now, I wanna make uh, one thing very specifically clear is if this seems like a lot, that's because Dan is the best and this is super cool. So I'm gonna make sure before this discussion is over that we're gonna just give you like two things you can do to be streaming uh, right now and, and elevating your production quality with those various things that uh, Dan already mentioned in that graphic. A few questions about will this be posted? Yes, the, this will be posted um, and you'll be able to play this back later if you want. All right, sorry to cut you off, Dan. Were you headed somewhere? No, that's fine. No, no, I mean, to, to, uh, I'm 100% I'm with you on the issue of this feeling a little bit over the top and, and not wanting people to be discouraged that they can't do it. So I think the, no, no, not, the not A10 the Mini that I pointed... Not over the top, aspirational. <laughs> this is aspirational for all of us. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful, Graham. Thank you. The, the A10 Mini is, so, or any of those kind of products are a great start because not only are they a switcher, they're also a way of getting that feed into the computer. So that gives you the power to have multiple cameras coming in. You can do a lot of really fancy things that, that are under the hood with some of those devices, even sit, things as simple as a little web presenter. So that's just got, you know, SDI or HDMI in on the back of it. Wait a second. Well, I'm, I should be using my technology here, shouldn't I? So you've got SDI in on the back of it, HDMI in, you can run in your own audio devices, and then that connects with that USB to the computer and again, fools the computer into thinking that it's a webcam so that you can use it for Zoom, for Skype or for live streaming. So really simple ways to get your, your uh, content into the computer or into a stream. Um, and the other ones to remember, because I know it was a bit of a whirlwind before, that Canon, I mean, there'll be a lot of videographers out there, I would assume with Canon DSLRs, not all of them are supported, but certainly the more recent ones, there's a decent, decent list of them, will run that uh, Canon webcam utility. And I'll just switch across to that one again there. So that's which just is, a USB cable running. Yeah, which is the Canon it's free. web. It's that's free. Right. It just came out. Avail it's now, I think, Mac compatible as well. It was only PC for a hot second there. So, yeah. 
That's right. So this is running into a Mac and, and, you know, you can easily get a USB extension cable if you need to get the camera a little further away from you, but that's a brilliant way of getting something into your stream that has that large sensor format. You can put fast prime lenses on it, make things look really beautiful. So that's a super achievable way of doing it. And then obviously you step down to things like phones and the old webcam here as well. So, you know, loads of options to add different angles that even if, you know, the webcam obviously doesn't look anything like the Monstro does, We'll switch between those. So, you know, we're talking about very different things here, but it still, it still gives you a new perspective on whatever story you're trying to tell. It still gives you a new angle and something that just wakes the audience up and goes, oh, okay, this is, this is another level to, than, than what I was expecting. So yeah, plenty of options there for people. Dan, can we uh, touch? So this is a question that I personally get all of the time and it sort of relates to just general latency. I mean, you already kind of touched on this. You said you had to have a, uh, your video go in a very specific spot. Bonded The bonded capability obviously is super helpful. But I did have a question here from Tyler Stallman uh, related to audio delay using OBS. They're always running into audio delay, it sounds like. And this all, all sorts of sort of ties back into your listening party with Violent Soho, right? Because I mean, that was a critical concern. They're a band how do you make the audio crystal clear, sound fantastic in a streaming environment? Do you have a couple of tips for us out here for that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, without knowing their setup, it's a little, I'm just gonna switch to the other mic here. Without knowing their setup, it's a little hard to give any direct help with the audio delay because there are a lot of different things that can introduce that. What I can tell you is certainly things like Mimo Live and I'm pretty sure OBS, definitely vMix, have the ability to correct for delay so they can they can basically move the audio either direction so that or, or slip the audio or the vision so that you can get things in sync so Mimo Live for instance has a layer in it call which is specifically for testing to see whether things are in sync so it'll play a little visual blip and audio blip at the same time and you can send that out to your devices or to your stream and have someone at the other end check it and then as they're watching it you can be correcting it and they can tell you when you're back in so there's way, really great ways of fixing that the uh, to answer the question on audio quality i'll use my nerdy ndi uh screen capture thing again here let me just jump into that and i'll show you uh, a really good example of how you can up the quality levels of your audio. So if I jump that one on here, um, it should come up in a second. So if I jump into the video, we go into the settings here. So when, when we did that telethon with the band, obviously they, it was the first time people were hearing their album. So the quality of it was, was absolutely critical to them. So if you go into the audio settings here, um, sorry, that's the wrong spot. It will be in broadcast quality. So you can see there, you can go all the way up to 256 kilobits per second. And that the, the label management band, they all commented without us asking about how good the quality of the music was coming through on the other end of the stream. Um, you do have to realize that bumping that up does mean that you might sacrifice a little bit on your video quality if you're on a, a, a limited internet connection as I was. We were fortunate enough, we didn't see the evidence of that. So we were running a five megabit um, HD video vision stream, but then having that audio at 256 kilobits made a huge difference. So I think that's that's a huge selling point for devices like this. Very cool. Um, creative solutions, folks. Apologies for bouncing all around here in the questions, but I'm going to take one from Dev Darm. Kalsa, hope I did okay there, Dev, with the name. Um, what's a good budget setup for live streaming with mirrorless cameras or iPhone tablet? Again, Dan, I mean, everyone's situation is a little bit different, right? But if any ballpark like number we can put on this, do you know what I'm saying? Is is there a, a small budget that we can sort of throw out there that says, look, if you already have a mirrorless camera, you have a phone, do you need to spend any money? Not necessarily. I mean, it's it's really comes down to what capability you have to get that those into a computer. So if you if you use something like a video go, you can run the mirrorless camera directly into that. It's got a separate audio input, so you could run a mic in separately, and it can take care of putting those together to stream out. If you want to do something with multiple camera angles, that's where the software solution is the cheapest way to go. So you go and get something like an A10 Mini Pro and work out how to get things in. But for people on a budget, I think they should be looking more at things like OBS um, and again, it's really just a without knowing which camera it is, it's a little hard to say for sure. sure how they get that into the computer. But at the very least, you're probably looking at some kind of a, a, a um, 
Input device is one from AJA that's really good. The name of it escapes me. I want to say PTAP, but I don't think that's correct. Um, then there's things like the web presenter that I mentioned before. So really your goal is how do I get the output of the, a clean output of this camera into my computer? And from there, the options are almost limitless. Like you can mess with it in so many different ways. Um, so I think that as far as budgets go, you probably, I think maybe a web presenter here in Australia, we might be looking at $500 Australian. So something like th two, two fifty, three hundred US, something like that. Don't quote me on that. I'm just trying to remember those prices off the top of my head. But yeah, some of those smaller devices that will just take a HDMI or an SDI feed, convert it to Thunderbolt or USB-C or USB-2 or something like that to get into a computer. You, you, you're in the hundreds of dollars to do that. Um, if you want to run multiple cameras in, you should be able to run multiple of those devices to get those feeds into your computer. And then it's up to something like OBS or vMix or Mimo Live to take those feeds and combine them into something really engaging along with graphics and good sound. Very cool. Um, see that? So a couple hundred bucks, which isn't the biggest price tag, uh, it, all the way down to not that many, uh, not that many dollars. Um, okay, so we have another question here. This is an easy one. What was the name of that Canon app i think it's just called what is it e a canon web utility or e eos e if you if you google eos eos webcam utility you should get there it pops right up yeah it's it's uh free um let's see here so bob lord asks uh would you show yeah, we already kind of covered the microphone setup what mic are you using and what pickup pattern does it have do you have a shotgun overhead i'm guessing dan yeah, let me quickly flick to that for you. Um, so it's a Shopes MK41, which is sort of like the gold standard of um, of indoor location sound mics. I'll just show that to you in one sec. It should be coming up. Yep. So that's it there. So it's a really nice little small. So the part, the back part of it is a driver. So that's what provides the power. Uh, and then there's a little capsule on the front that's called the MK41. Um, and yeah, I've, I've only recently got into these mics, but I've never, I'll never turn back. They're absolutely brilliant. And then for the lapel, I'm using a Sennheiser AVX um, lapel system. Um, okay, so we have a question here about bonded signals in the field. I know this, this is not my area. I do know that Teradek has a bonded single backpack i mean I'm, I'm forgetting the exact name of the product dan maybe you remember but uh dev that might be something that you should look into dan, yeah, it's called i'm pretty sure it's just called sorry yeah i think it's just called yep. bond i'm pretty sure the teradek bond and it's um here in australia i think you're looking at about ten thousand australian dollars to get pricier. one fully loaded with all the nodes i think it's got something like 10 nodes in it don't quote me on that but it's, it's such a cool solution. So literally you wear a backpack, which you can wear if you're running around doing say street reportage or something like that, or you can hang it up in your studio if you want to do it that way. And yeah, I mean, it, it creates a uh, impermeable connection to the outside world. It's, it's pretty impressive stuff. Yeah, so for being truly in the field where there is no Wi-Fi, nothing else, I mean, that I think is the kind of solution that you're going to be looking for um well and, and sorry to interrupt there but yeah, no. some, so you can go as simple as something like this video go in the field because it does have an internal battery so i think you get a couple of hours out of the internal battery you've got the two uh 4g modems on either side plus you can hotspot your phones to it so you don't have to have an ethernet or a wi-fi for that to work you can be out in the field and be completely mobile and be streaming something extremely solid. And, and once you've got everything set up in the app, which you can do before you head out, if it's a high pressure situation, it's really as simple as connecting the camera and pushing the red button on the front and you're live. And, and you can be, so if you combine it with Teradex Core, which is what we did for our listening party, Core, not to get too deep on the nerdy of it, but the, the, the power of that is you can have multiple, so, multiple destinations. So Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, whatever else, Periscope. Uh, and you can also have the ability to stream out in H.265, which is a newer, more efficient codec, which means if you're in my situation where I was on a very ordinary internet connection, I could go out at a more efficient codec, so less bandwidth, and then Core takes care of converting that and sending it down to the different destinations. Uh, so yeah, just really stable, really smart uh, solutions there. I mean, Dan, I just want to highlight something really important you said is the sentence before you get in the field. Like with all production, <laughs> this is not something you want to be sort of winging like the 30 minutes before going live, right? Like everything, it requires uh, preparation. Um, yeah, look, I mean, it's the old uh, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance, I think is the, the slogan that I was taught. And, and you know, I've, I've put a little bit of time into setting up these cues so that 
I don't have to kind of, oh, geez, you know, wait, just let me find that. I'll open up Windows Explorer and find that WMV file. You know, it's all sitting there ready to go. You preloaded it and you just tap a queue and it comes up and you don't lose your audience in that little moment of fumbling around. So I think that, yeah, preparation is really important. Exactly. Um, uh, question from Jay, is that the Laowa 20 millimeter probe up front with the light on in the on the desk? Is that what that is? Yes, very well spotted. That's complete gratuitous nerd prop there um and anybody and and i should also point out the camera it's on is the new chronos 2.1 thousand frames a second camera so anybody who knows this configuration will know that i'm a complete fraud because if you tried to shoot a thousand frames a second at f14 you'd need the light of a thousand suns to actually get exposure so it's strictly for the purposes of having this really wanky flare into the camera and just because it's cool. So yeah, thanks for noticing. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Yeah, Dan, no, you're in no danger of anyone calling you a fraud, let me tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Richard Fl uh, Richard Fiander asks, no black magic cams, what about camera control? I, I, I'm assuming, Richard, you're meaning you can feel free to follow up if you like things like just aperture control and bumping ISO while sitting at the desk, things like that, Richard? I'm guessing. Dan, yeah, what about that's camera a, control? That's, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so I think, Again, like our starting point for this conversation is probably um, th there'll be people watching this that maybe have a lot more live streaming experience than me who none of this was news to. And they probably work in an environment that's much more suited to live streaming. We're kind of starting at a point of, I'm a filmmaker, I make content, I've got cameras, how do I get them live? And that's sort of where we're, where we're coming from. I've still got some, some control. You saw me messing with the focus before. I can set up different devices to control. I could put iris motors on. I could, um, you know, run some kind of, I could run full control for my Monstro, for instance, and have control on my phone of the different settings of that. But certainly for critical, critical live situations, you, you are going to be better off in the world of things like, so there's an Australian company called Bird Dog that do some amazing PTZ cameras. You could combine those with the Teradek Orbit, which is like this ridiculous 4K base station for a, sorry, PTZ is the little domes that you can pan and tilt and zoom and you do it all from a remote control. Those all have the ability to color correct, to change aperture, ISO, or any focus, any of those settings. They also have really good autofocus. That's a world that's probably, if, if all you're wanting to do is live streaming, that's the path you want to go down. Um, Pete, that, that, those all work over this NDI protocol I was telling you about. So that's the one that I was using to get my phone wirelessly in. So you could just run an ethernet cable to those bird dog cameras. And that one ethernet cable does audio, video and control and power. So if you have a power over ethernet switch, that does the entire thing. So it's a insanely flexible way of doing it. The, I, I bought my video go from an Australian company called Streaming Guys, little shout out to them because their after sale support was exceptional. I should also note that none of this stuff, all of this stuff I bought with my own card, hard earned cash, uh, none of its endorsements. So by me showing them to you, it's me saying, I think they're really good products. That's why I bought them. So just to put that one out there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay, question here from, so Rob Warren, Salt Line Media says, can you play back a video with audio over Zoom webinar from your streaming system? Rob, you might have joined us uh, a smidgen late there, but but Dan, do you want to bring up that uh, yeah, so, Soho listening yep. party? So there's the, oh, there's, there's the, the behind the scenes. So I'm, I'm bringing up the audio now on my... And now I'm dynamically dropping the audio again. In the so the audio back down. a pile of skateboards and dirty clothes. And then if I tap that cue again, it takes it away. So by loading that, preloading those assets in, why don't I just quickly show you and stop me if you want to go somewhere else with this. I'll just show you, show you the cue list over there. It might be useful for people to see what's possible. So if I just flick to the iPhone there. So if you see here, I've got all of the preloaded cues down there. So that's all of the things that I'm controlling with that remote. And then over here, I've got all of my source media. So really the, the possibilities are practically, you can see up the top there, that's the letterbox I talked about, that PNG graphic that's live at the moment and the little social tags. Uh, and then down the bottom, you can see I've got my C500 camera in there. Um, so yeah, just an example of how much power this system has. Um, Aaron's asking a really, I think, important question here. Aaron, let me um, uh, just a little caveat here. So, so neither of us are, are Teradek engineers. So my experience, I don't know about yours, Dan, with the Cube 655 is I, I can't specifically speak to that product directly, but I'm gonna go to the second part of Aaron's question because I do think it's 
uh, important. Is there a computer free solution for conducting a live interview where the interviewer and interviewee have camera crews on both ends and it's being sent out live to an audience, computer free? Which can you read that one? Let's just say that one more time. Yeah, uh, is there a computer free solution for conducting a live interview where the interviewer and interviewee have camera crews on both ends and it's being sent out live to an audience? I guess Aaron's talking about sending like one camera person and then being able to take their feed. Well, I, I might be misinterpreting it, but she might be talking about the challenge of getting a return feed to each of those locations. So the interview, interviewer would want to see the interviewee, but then both of those feeds might want to be sent to a broadcast, to, to a switching room somewhere. Yeah, so the, the Teradek has, this is past my, my knowledge of Teradek a little bit, but I know with some of their products like Slice and T-Rax and some of those higher end ones, that's where you're talking about encode and decode. So you'd have something like a video go or some, even a bond, like something more hardcore than that, which is taking the feed of say the interviewees camera, sending that to uh, a slice, which then decodes it and sends that back to the interviewer. Um, there might be more direct ways of doing that where they've, they've kind of, it would take multiples of these devices to do that because each you have to have an encode and a decode at either end. Um, but I've, I know for sure there are people doing it. I've heard a lot of people describe in that situation. I'll freely admit I'm not the guy to tell you how to do it, but I know it's possible. Um Aaron, feel free to follow up if, if we took your question in sort of a, a weird way, either here in the Q&A or over uh, social through through Dan's social channels. And maybe the uh, just a shout out to the Creative Solutions team, maybe some of you guys can put uh, Dan's sort of social tags in the comments, because what I do see are sort of a lot of very specific questions that relate to specific workflows that people are having. And I think one of the overwhelming things um, potentially about streaming, may, tell me if you disagree, Dan, is that there are so many little cubes that do similar things, right? That there just is many ways to put, uh, to put your stream out. And I mean, is there a, a, a method to the madness in your mind, Dan? Do you always try to make things in your mind as simple as possible? Because I think people can get wrapped up and like, ah, SDI goes here and then converts to HDMI and then yeah, look, I think that's why when we talked about doing this, I decided to run it all through Mimo Live because I think I really feel like so many of us that are solo content creators or production houses, you know, we're not just camera people. We generally have an edit suite for, for some purpose. So you've got that resource sitting there. It doesn't have to be an iMac Pro like I've got here. It can be a, it can be a MacBook Pro or, some, or a Windows device. I think the idea of just figuring out a way using some of the techniques I've talked about to get your cameras into a computer everything gets a lot easier from there because it's not about patching. It's not about what, what sort, you, you don't have to worry about frame rates as much. You don't have to worry about resolutions as much. So a lot of switching devices, like the one I use for the listening party, everything needs to be more or less the same format. So it needs to be the same frame rate. It often needs to be the same resolution. So it all had, for me, it all had to be 1080p 25. So I had to use in some, for the 6D Mark II, I had to use this, everyone should, uh, it, this is the Swiss army knife of converters. This is the red bite, um, MDHX decimator. Uh, actually, all you have to do is Google red bite decimator. Um, this will basically convert HDMI and SDI into anything you need to. And so I use one of these to get, because I could only get 1080p 60 out of that um, 60 Mark II. And then you have all these problems, like I couldn't get rid of the white box that shows the autofocus working. So I had to turn off autofocus to get a clean feed into the computer. So that, those kind of things are a real challenge when you're dealing with trying to get them into some kind of a video switcher. If all you're doing is trying to get it into the computer, that removes a lot of those obstacles. So for in, in the case of this 6D Mark II now, if we switch across to that again, it's just a USB cable and I've still got autofocus. Let's hope this works. If I kind of move closer to it, it should pull focus on my hand at some point. There, there, so I've still got the power of autofocus on that and, and I'm getting a clean feed. That is a real challenge. There's a lot of cameras out there that'll give you some kind of a path out of the camera like HDMI, but it'll often have a bunch of junk on the screen. You have to work out how to get rid of the overlays and whatnot to get yourself a really nice clean feed. So certainly something like that EOS webcam utility is really powerful because you know that once it's in the computer, it's all clean. Um, I think this is going to be a quick uh, yes or no, Dan, but do you have an experience with QTake? This is a question from Dijan uh, Boscovic. QTake? No, I don't, but I've heard a lot of really good things about it. I mean, when I was um, had one of the first red ones in Australia and was renting them out to production companies everywhere, the QTake had just started around that time and they, they quickly became the gold standard for on-set film monitoring. 
I don't know much more about it than that. So I'm sorry, I can't offer uh, any more assistance. No worries. Um, so, you know, keep the technical uh, questions coming, folks. We don't have a ton of ton of time left here. So, Dan, I wanted to hit you with sort of a, I don't know, philosophical question here. Um, I mean, not all content is inherently perfect for streaming. Do you know what I mean? How can you sort of craft um, your project specifically to uh, that medium? And do you think you're always going to be doing streaming projects once everything's sort of uh, officially opens up. And I guess that's a question for everybody too, is, you know, streaming seems here to stay for people that primarily worked in the field uh, before. What do you think? What's your take on on the content and streaming? It's a, it's a really good question. I, I mean, the, the pros of streaming, there are a couple of them. I think there's a sense of immediacy that it gives that makes people a little more engaged. So I think if they know that it's live, they're more likely to hang around and see what happens. If it's a pre-produced video, they might sort of see the duration counter at the bottom and go, oh, 10 minutes, uh, I've got time for that. I'll watch it some other time. Whereas when it's live, it, it kind of gives them a reason to stay. It also, from a technical standpoint, from what I've heard, will push you to the front of the queue in terms of things like the algorithms of Facebook and YouTube. So they, they're really pushing for live content to be a thing. So if you go live, you're often gonna be out front of some of the other content that people are pre-producing. So that's another good reason. As far as what the subject matter is, I think it really comes down to your strengths both technically and in terms of performance. So you need to be engaging without too many stumbles and and, and slip ups, um, whether that means using a teleprompter. I've got one for my, I've got a, I'll just bring up a little thing on the side here. So I, I do a political satire, little plug for that. It's called The Undercurrent. Um, that's how I get out all of my political anger. It's a bit of a catharsis for me. Um, I've So that's heavily animated in After Effects. I'm now using this Mimo Live. I'm planning to be able to do a lot of that level of graphic quality live. And to make sure that I don't stuff up and make people bored, I've figured out a way to run my teleprompter with a foot controller. So I've got these foot pedals that will actually speed up or slow down my script. So this stuff, I don't use a teleprompter for that stuff. Um, I just kind of memorize them line by line. But if I'm going to do it live, I'm not going to put people through that pain. I'm going to have a teleprompter and I'm going to read the script and try to be still be as engaging as I can, but add those extra layers of graphics and whatnot to really kind of keep people engaged. Jeez, Dan, what do you do in your free time? <laughs> Building a cubby house for my kids at the moment. That's fun. <laughs> oh, well, fair enough. All right, good. Just, just, just checking in on you. You got a lot of stuff going on, <laughs> which is cool to see. Um, all right. So, Live Studio Six. Are you familiar at all with that software? Another yes or no. If not, that's fine. We just have no, to not sorry. No, that's all right. Um, uh, I guess one more time, real fast. How are you streaming? Everyone seemed just blown away by the fact that you can just stream uh, real quick from your from your iPhone. How are you doing that yeah. in a nutshell? <laughs> yeah, cool. So um, NDI, that format that I told you before, that was developed by a company called NewTek. Um, and they were kind enough to make that open source. So when the COVID crisis hit, they actually released a few of those um, products like the one for the phone for free, which is really good of them. So I'm using, let me get the actual name of the app so you can check it on the app store. Uh, it is called NDI space HX space camera is the app I'm using. Uh, and then the one I was using to bring my phone, con the screen content shared onto the screen was NDI HX Capture. So those two apps, if you get a hold of those, you do still need something on the other end that receives NDI, but there's also a whole suite of free tools. If you Google for Mac or PC, NDI tools, there's a package you can install, which will put a whole heap of things on your computer that will basically sit there and go, it's like it's, like it's constantly broadcasting. It's saying, hey, who's got some NDI for me? Can I take it? Can I put it in? Um, so if you get, get those two things on either end, Mimo Live, the software I'm using here, has NDI functionality built into it. So as soon as I have, I can, as soon as I turn this app on, Mimo Live can see it as a source and go, hey, do you want to use this? And I could just throw that live. Very cool, Dan. So we're nearly at time here. Uh, apologies if I go over just one or two minutes. This is an extremely important question that I want to try to get a, a quick answer to, and then we'll sort of wrap up here. Carlos uh, Tomeo says, how can I use live stream from a film set to get a clean feed to my client and get audio video feedback from them? This is actually so key, Dan. I had a call yesterday from a huge network in the United States saying, how can we see not just dailies, but how can we see a feed out of the camera in the room without putting 
a, a crew of six, to, there you go, six to 10 people yeah. in this space. So that's your recommendation right there, video video go. But, but if, I mean, if it was me, yeah. I'd be using this because it, it's bulletproof. Like it, it's, it's, just a, it's just a bulletproof solution. There are, I've got a couple of friends, um, um, Mark Toy is a good mate of mine, who's a, who's a really good TVC director over here, works internationally. He's figured out a way to actually, uh, he's got found some little devices, the name of which escaped me. I can probably find them to connect with people on socials later that will take an SDI or a HDMI in and send USB-C out into a phone. So you can have an Android phone and basically be taking a camera feed into that. And then on your phone, you could have Zoom or whatever kind of streaming solution and your clients are on the other end connected to it. So get it, getting the content out uh, to the net is probably the easiest part of that equation, if you ask me, especially with products like this or what I just talked about. The hard part is choosing which platform you're going to use for secure viewing. So obviously you don't just want to throw this stuff on YouTube. You want to have some kind of secure back end that um, actually you'll just see if you if you start firing another question, I'll just find the name of this app that I've tried recently that gives you a pretty good method of doing that. Yeah, totally. So um, we're nearly at time here. So I think uh, so Aaron video uh, video pro versus Turdeck cube um, in the comments section, I encourage you to check out the comparison uh, that Joel from creative solutions put down that'll sort of give you the differences in both of those devices. But Carlos, what a great question. This is something that we're dealing with all of the time um, right now in production. It's just, you can't have as many people in the room. So streaming, you know, very much a necessity now to be quite honest. So, okay, Dan, final word from you. Um, maybe somebody's still a little bit overwhelmed. Can I have like two or three sentences, positive encouragement? You too can uh, have an awesome streaming business or at least part of what you're doing. Can I get something like that from you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, th I think the easiest first step is work out how to get your camera feed into a computer and then get OBS, which is free as a starting point. OBS has a ton of functionality in it. Once you're comfortable with that, you can start looking at some of the paid software like vMix or Mimo Live. Uh, and then when it comes to getting it to the net, those packages will do it for you initially, then start looking at things like the video go, which give you that bonded, secure, multiple destination kind of power. Those are, those are the, the main steps, I would say. Very cool. So we're going to drop one more blog post in the comments. I just got uh, literally direct from Teradek right now in iMessage to check out the article, how to set up remote monitoring and create a virtual video village. So we'll put that link specifically in the comments, but also you can just straight up Google that right now and it'll pop uh, right up. So clearly they've been thinking about this too. Um, Dan, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I am now inspired to do a little bit more personally with what I have sort of going on here. So uh, I really, I really appreciate your time today. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity. It was good chatting. And, and uh, yeah, if anyone has questions, love to connect on social media later on. Check out The Undercurrent if you've got time. And uh, the Greats Media YouTube channel is pretty bare at the moment, but the plan is to really start pushing a lot of training and how-to videos onto that in the near future. So if you can subscribe to that, it'd be awesome. Great. Okay. A few more items of business here as, as we sign off, but I, I think it's important to point out again that people have been saying this, but during the pandemic is not the time to write the great, the great uh, next novel. Same way. It's not the time to just change the entire world of streaming. Don't put that kind of pressure on yourself. Just put out an excellent product. Uh, okay. Coming up next on CS Presents, we have a uh, discussion titled Remote Commercial Production with Cinematographer Mahai Malimar. Malimar? Um, I hope I did okay there with the name. And that is June 25th at 10 a.m. PST. Again, that's all about remote commercial production. So that's gonna be definitely one to tune into. Um, don't forget to go to cs.inc to sign up for more upcoming webinars and, and to be part of the live audience, of course, keep asking questions. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without all of you folks out there uh, watching. So again, if you didn't get a chance to get your question answered, follow up with Dan later, check out his website, uh, greatsmedia.com. That's G-R-A-E-T-Z media.com. Thanks everyone. That's it for us. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks again for tuning in. Bye guys.